Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace. Happy Mother's Day. Let's stand and sing together. Amen, amen. Good to see you. It's good to be reminded who we are in Christ. You may be seated. My name is Brian Vaughn. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Church. Welcome. Psalm 118 verse 24 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. It's his day. Amen. Let's rejoice. And on this day, we especially want to honor moms. Happy Mother's Day, moms. And we can think of no better way to celebrate Mother's Day, what a great way to celebrate Mother's Day than to dedicate some babies to the Lord and some families and pray over them. Would you welcome these families today? <laughs> Starting off with the Backland family, Chris and Kathy and their son, Cooper David. Welcome. Would you welcome them this morning? Good to see you guys. Yes, and Gabriel Neve, the son of Tom and Meredith Bruner. I knew you, Meredith, when you were like this big. Goodness, the son of Tom and Meredith Bruner. Would you welcome the Bruner family today? Awesome. James David, he's the son of John and Joanna Eaton. Welcome, Eaton family. Good to see you guys today. And another part of the Eaton family, Caroline Grace, the daughter of Dan and Maggie Eaton. Good to see you, Eatons. Glad you're here today. Good hair. Yes, Olivia Lynn, the daughter of Tom and Katie Fitzenberger. Precious. Good to see Fitzenbergers today. Good to see you guys. Would you welcome them? Blake Henry. Hi, Blake. 
Good to see you, the son of Zach and Kayla Germo. Welcome, Germo. It's good to see you guys today. Hi, Blake. Yes. Kiri Rebecca. Kiri Rebecca, the daughter of Marcus and Anna Johannes. Good to see you guys. Glad you're here today. Good morning, Kiri. Yes. Calvin Josiah, the son of Barry and Elizabeth Miller. Good to see Millers. Hello, Calvin. Good to see you. Welcome the Millers this morning. Yes. And Harper Cove, the daughter of Patrick and Sh Shanna Nelson. The pa yeah, would you welcome the Nelson families this morning? Good to see you guys. Yes. Lan Landon Dean, Landon Dean, the son of Parker and Ashley O'Brien. Good to see the O'Briens today. Welcome, you guys. Aiden Jude, the son of Nick and Christina Olson. Would you welcome the Olsons today? Yes. Jeremy James, good morning, Jeremy. Jeremy James, he's the son of Thomas and Sarah Oswald. Good to see the Oswald family today. Yes, Harper Jean, she's the daughter of Stephen and Allie Pog. Good to see the Pogs today. And Maya, she's the daughter of Taurus and Vita Radjasuk. Would you welcome the, welcome the Radjasuks this morning? Good to see you guys. They just keep coming. There's a bunch. Wow. Ariella Grace and Amelia Hope, daughters of Nick and Krista Skumats. Good to see the Skumatses today. Dorothy Christine, the daughter of Gregory and Leah Swaim. Good to see Swaim family in the house today. Dorothy. Thank you. Emma Elizabeth, the daughter of JP and Andrea Turner. Good to see Turners today. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Eliana Catherine, the daughter of Chris and Julie Vogel. Would you welcome the Vogels today? <laughs> Sylvie Elliott, the daughter of Jim and Lauren Warwick. Welcome the Warwicks today. Good morning, Sylvie. Yes. Aaliyah Corvette Lynn, the daughter of Tiana Hallman and Victor Williams. Would you welcome them this morning? Good morning. Do you have a little card for me? Yes, you do. This is Jessica Joy and Joanna Joy. They are the daughters of Ben and Sarah Bright this morning. Would you welcome them this morning? And to my left... Ryan May, she is the daughter of Aaron and Katie Chandler. Good to see you guys this morning. Hallstrom family, a little card for me. Right in the back pocket. <laughs> Zoe Grace and Carter Mitchell, they are the children of Mitch and Kelsey Hallstrom. Would you welcome the Hallstroms today? Good to see you guys. Yes, and Redford Mark. He's the son of Tyler and Shane Hartman. Good morning, Hartman. It's good to see you guys. Glad you're here today. Yes. Colby Jane and Harper Lane. Oh, precious. The daughters of Sam and Katie Havlick. Good to see you guys this morning. Would you welcome the Havlicks? <clears throat> Thank you, buddy. Sayla Joy. She's the daughter of Aaron and Jeanette Jones. Good morning, Jones family. Good to, oh, she's smiling at me. She's totally smiling. I love it. Good to see you guys. And Lydia Jean. She's the daughter of Jack and Amy Paul. Good morning, Paul family. Good to see you guys. Glad you're here. Perry family. Chloe June, the daughter of Matt and Heather Perry, would you welcome them this morning? Good morning, Perry family. Eliana Charlene, she's the daughter of Joey and Kate Reynolds. Good morning, Reynolds family. Good to see you guys. Precious. Yes, Jackson James, the son of Scott and Lauren Schiller. Good to see you, Scott and Lauren. Good to see you guys this morning. Welcome, Schiller family. 
and Rosemary Ann and Lucille Lynn, the daughters of Mike and Kristen Solfelt. Good morning, Solfelt family. Good to see you guys. <coughs> yes, Olivia Rose. Good morning, Olivia Rose, the daughter of Nicholas and Katie Tift. Good morning, Tifts. Glad you guys are here today. Welcome. <coughs> Charleston Joy and Stella Grace, the daughters of Luke and Tiffany Wallen. Would you welcome the Wallen family today? <clears throat> yes. And Levi James, the son of Nicholas and Brianna Wyland. Good to see you, Wylands. Welcome. So glad you guys are here. Welcome all of our families this morning. Our children's pastor, Tim Shellhammer, is coming up. Would you welcome all these families today? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Pastor Brian. We have a full stage, a full stage. This is good. So families, to dedicate these kids, I'm going to take us into the Bible, into two passages. Um, and I would say these two passages tell us two groups we unapologetically want to have these kids in. First one is Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. There the Bible says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Um, so may these kids be counted amongst that group. And then the second one is Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. There the Bible says, After this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one can number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's the end game. That's where we all want to end up. So may these kids be found within that multitude as well. Um, and so we'll dedicate these kids today. And we, we are and we continue to disciple them intentionally through all the years that the Lord gives us with them. And we do that in homes. And also we, we do that as a broader, bigger church. Uh, so everyone here in the seats, would you stand with us? Families, take a look out at the church body here at Grace Church. You know, we here at Grace say we exist to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ across the street and around the world. Uh, at child dedications, I'm also re are normally reminded of if we want to put a, a face to that mission, church, if we want to put a face to that mission that we have here, we don't need to look any further than these kids up on the stage. Um, so on that note, let's, let's extend a hand toward these kids and I'll close the dedication with prayer uh, Lord we lift these children up to you Jesus Christ we pray that every one of these kids will come to know you as their Lord and Savior before they face eternity so that they make their way safely home Holy Spirit we pray for the day that you dwell inside of these kids and their lives will never be the same Triune God we pray that your, your grace and your sacrifice and your power means a great deal to these kids in their lives. Lord, we pray that these kids have zealous hearts that are turned on by you and you alone, obedient hearts that follow your will and your plan for their life, humble hearts that can't believe all you've done for them despite all they've done to you, and convicted hearts, fully aware of and broken by their sin, awestruck by your mercy and grace, and never graduate from your cross. Lastly, Lord, we as a church pray that these kids' ambition will go towards your great commission. Amen. Round of applause for these families. Amen. Such a beautiful thing, and just leading families, leading children uh, in truth submitted to Christ, and uh, I, my prayer for my children every single day is, Lord, just, just save my children, and um, let me not mess it up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, I think just the idea that we should, should continually teach our children, but then also remind ourselves of the thing that we should lean on every single day is the mercy and the grace of God, amen? Ephesians 2 said, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in, once you, uh, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit 
that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this together. And praise the Lord, His mercy is more, and stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
thankful for that.
Christ alone. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Welcome. Thanks for coming today. I certainly want to say a huge hello to you, everyone at the uh, chapel behind us, everyone at the Chassis campus, and certainly a huge hello to everyone watching online today. Uh, happy Mother's Day today. So we celebrate every mother, every woman in this place today. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And we have a, uh, a special guest that I want to come and just uh, pray a prayer over you. So it's my wife, Sherry, who's also the director of our women's ministry. <laughs> Sherry's going to come and she's going to pray over you. Go right ahead. Let's pray. Lord, as we think of the meaning of today, we are grateful for the privilege of being a woman. In our very essence, we are all mothers who bear life and who share life. So today we bless our birth mothers and adoptive mothers, our foster mothers, our single mothers, our stepmothers, our grandmothers, and our spiritual mothers. Help us as women to seek first your kingdom. Help us to be faithful. Help us to rise up as mothers in our homes, our churches, and our communities. Change us from the inside out and cause us to clothe ourselves with compassion and tenderness and love and kindness as we parent, disciple, shepherd, and mentor others. Lord, we recognize that today is also challenging for women. For many, it is a day of rejoicing and it's a day of sorrow. So for every mother who has lost a baby or a child, God, would you pour out your compassion on her? And to the mom who is hoping for reconciliation with a son or daughter, would you work for good in her situation? And to the one who teaches and trains her children day after day, would you fortify her weary frame? To the mom of special needs children, would you sustain her with your loving kindness? To our sister, to our sister who chose abortion, would you continue to heal her heart? To our infertile sister, would you grant her this pregnancy? To our single mom, would you give her community to come alongside her? To those who have lost their mothers, would you comfort their anguished hearts? And to the sister who is grieving today, would you preserve her life according to your word? With you, Lord, all things are possible. By faith, we call upon you and we wait and we trust you with every need that we have. You are with us, you are sovereign, you are good, you are greatly to be praised, and we rise up and we bless your name, and we rise up as mothers who bear your image, and we aim our life at the kind of motherhood that displays the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you, and we are grateful for the opportunity to bear and to share life in Jesus' name. And all of the women said, amen. amen. And all of the men said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yep. Amen. Well, there's the message. We could do a benediction and head to the house, but we're not going to. I was thinking this week, you know, if the Hallmark Channel were to create and then uh, run a reality a TV series based on your Christian life, keeping it real like with the Kinsels, right, would, would the audience after watching you do you, be drawn to or repelled from the person of Jesus Christ. So if the cameras were rolling and they were on you, all eyes on you all the time, would your lifestyle make a compelling case for trusting in and following the person of, of Jesus Christ? 
Or are there things that you say and do, maybe habits and values that you espouse that are a complete turnoff? It's interesting in the New Testament, Paul told Timothy, his protege in ministry, to do two things. He said, number one, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. 1 Timothy 4.16 essentially says this, watch your life and your doctrine closely. And that alignment is really important. What we believe and how we live, we have to have those two to be aligned. If not, we become susceptible to hypocrisy. And we would all say, yeah, watch your doctrine closely. Like we get that, right? It is hugely important to get the Bible right, to read it, to know it, to obey it, to do exactly what it says. But we are also called to watch our lives closely too. Because the truth of the matter is that there are other people who are watching your life closely. And they are drawing conclusions about Christ in the process. Well, in our, in our text for the day, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, Paul warns us against placing obstacles and or roadblocks in the way of another person coming to faith in Jesus Christ by the way we live our lives. So let's stand together in honor of God's word. 2 Corinthians 6, we'll read verses 3 to 10. Paul writes, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true. Verse nine, as unknown yet well-known as dying and behold, we live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord, you may be seated. Now, what you're going to see here is like right, like right out of the gate, right out of the gate, Paul says that, that we actually put obstacles in people's way, roadblocks, if you will, in the way of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ based on how we endure trials. Like people are watching how you handle trials and troubles and tragedies. They're paying close attention to that. And so in verses four and five, Paul says, listen, let me kind of tell you what I've gone through. I've endured afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Paul's like, listen, I, I've seen it all. I, I've experienced it all. Like I've been there through it all. Like I've seen troubles and trials from every perspective, troubles in general, troubles from other people, uh, self-inflicted troubles. You see, Paul wants everyone to know that in the midst of even the most extreme of trials and tragedies and troubles, that he didn't quit on Christ, that he didn't blame other people, he didn't whine or complain or gripe, to which I would say, I think it's vital, it's vital for us to understand that people are continually drawing conclusions about Christ based on how well Christians endure trials and tragedies and troubles. Like, like you know this, right? Like anybody can follow Christ when life is all ducks and bunnies, right? But that, that doesn't authenticate or legitimize Christ to anyone. Like that's not inspiring or compelling or appealing Christianity. Like no one's moved by that. No one's touched by that. Why? Because anyone can do it. Your life is awesome. Of course you follow Jesus Christ when your life is awesome. But when you endure with Christ and flourish in your faith through your pain, through your afflictions, through your job loss, right, loss of income stream, through the death of a spouse or a hard divorce or the tragedy of a child walking away from the faith or a health crisis or a tough marriage or ridicule or persecution from culture, when you endure it well, it says something to the world around you. 
It actually grabs the, the attention of an unbelieving world in a big time way. And here's what it declares. It declares that the gospel is true and that Jesus is worth it. Like there's a reason that you endure. There's a reason that you hang in there. Why? Because the gospel is true. Because Jesus Christ is worth everything to you. And so you, you don't quit, right? You, you don't tap out when life gets hard. And so godly endurance kind of paves the way for an unbelieving person to see the difference that Christ actually makes in life. That's why I would say it like this, Christians like, you gotta handle your business. You gotta handle your business when it comes to trials and tragedies and troubles because the world is watching to see the difference Christ makes when life is hard. And ultimately I would say this, like people cannot deny the reality of our faith in Christ when they see our endurance for Christ. So know this, like quitting, caving, being soft when life is hard absolutely hinders the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like who wants to be a part of a movement where there's no staying power, where there's no perseverance, where there's no grit and substance, right? Where, where there's no power to overcome tragedy and trial and, and troubles. Man, no one is signing up for that kind of Christianity. But if you will endure your hardships well, there is an unbelieving world watching and wondering what makes you different. Amen? Secondly, Paul says that we thrust obstacles in, in people's way when we, don't, when we don't fight graciously. You see this in verses 6 and 7. Let, and let me, explain, let me explain where I'm coming from here. Paul says that when you're being maligned for your faith, when you're being attacked for your faith... Right, a reference to afflictions, riots, imprisonments, beatings. He says, when your life is being maligned and attacked like that for your faith in Jesus Christ, is your life then marked by, verse six, is it marked by purity? Is it marked by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit being at work in you, by genuine love, by truthful speech? by the power of God, right? With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for, and for the left. And so when you're attacked, when you're maligned, when you're in a fight, do you fight with weapons of unrighteousness? Do you fight just like culture fights? Do you slander people? Do you lose your head or respond with violence or impatience or untruthfulness or impurity? Do you lie? Are you unkind? Are you unloving? Do you submit to the Holy Spirit or do you grieve the Holy Spirit in the way that you respond to people? Uh, big picture, I think Paul is telling us this. When you live like the world, when you talk like the world, and when you fight like the world, you don't set yourself apart from the world. You don't model for the world. You don't show the world that there is a different way to live and react and respond to both trials and attacks. Now, please hear me. Like I'm not, I'm not saying like don't stand up for Christ. I'm not saying like, like don't stand up for yourself. I'm not saying just let everybody run all over you and sit in your corner and pray. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, fight like someone who knows Jesus, not like a nut job on the lunatic fringe with no restraint or class or tact. And all of God's people said, amen, amen right? That makes sense. So walk and fight in the presence and power of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm gonna say this, this is especially important for us to hear right now. As reports surface, of the Supreme Court of the United States potentially overturning Roe v. Wade. So I am, I am, I am cautiously optimistic, by the way. But, but my larger point is this. You're seeing and you're going to see. So just like brace yourselves, okay? You're going to see gangster-like levels of impurity, and ungodliness and unkindness and untruth over this issue in the next few weeks 
and months. People are already losing their minds. The last thing the church needs to do is to behave just like the world. Amen. Amen. So I would say this, a temper is a good thing to have so long as you don't lose it. (laughs) Keep your heads. So I think it's important that we fight with weapons of righteousness in our right and left hands. Verse 7. So godly people don't fight in ungodly ways. Godly people don't respond in ungodly ways. So we use the weaponry that that God has given us. The word of God, the power of prayer, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, right? The belt of truth, the breastplate of, of righteousness, just to name a few. Moreover, here's what we do because we're controlled by the spirit. We're controlled by the Holy Spirit. We need to be calm and reasonable and logical, logical. There's not much logic in our culture today. Logical and biblical and careful and thoughtful and respectful and loving and truthful. Know the issues. You need to know the issues. Don't just be emotional. Don't just be emotional. I know there are tons of emotions like tied in with this. Don't just be emotional. Don't just tweet and blurt your thoughts. Use some restraint and some tact. But I I will say this, When when it comes to the issue of abortion, I think very few people actually address the fundamental issue of abortion. Now, now before I like, like talk about this, just for a few minutes here, let me, let me give you like three caveats, okay? Number one, I know it's Mother's Day and I have wrestled with this like all week long. Like you're gonna be the loser that ruins Mother's Day. And I'm like, I know, I know, I do feel that burden. Like Mother's Day is supposed to be cheery and flowery and yeah. We love mamas and we do. We love mothers. And it should be cheery and bright and amazing. It should. So I've wrestled all week long about talking about this on Mother's Day. Uh, But I also feel like because of, I think, the historical nature of like what is going on right now, I I think that we have to, we have to talk about it. And here, and here's what I know, like. And you don't have, please don't email me. Like, I know some of you are like, you need to talk about more stuff. You need to talk about less stuff. Like, I know this is like a lose-lose for me, okay? So you don't need to email me and go, yeah, you should do that more. Yeah, I know you think that. And then there are 500 other people who are like, you should do that less. So <laughs> your emails cancel each other out, okay? So, <laughs> you know, that doesn't help me. It didn't help. It doesn't help me, okay? Let me just, let me just try to follow Jesus in this, okay? Okay. Um, but I do feel like this. And I woke up this morning like talking to Sherry about it. Like, ah, oh, I don't want to do this. But, but I feel like our culture is on, a, uh, is on like a collision course with the church. Um, and that I don't want the church to get sucked in to all the, all the stuff that we're hearing and seeing. And I think a lot of people are. So I, I, I want to combat that. Number one. And then number two, we have heard that there are going to be protesters here today, either outside or maybe even in here. And so if, as I'm kind of walking through this, we have that experience, uh, I would just say, like, stay calm. uh, And please don't feel like you have to go tackle anybody, okay? Like, like just just relax. Like, if something happens, I'm just going to have all the grace people. Just stay seated. Stay calm. And we have security people that will graciously and lovingly remove that person from this place and try to have a conversation later, okay? So we, we want to be prepared and we are prepared for that. And then number three, you need to hear me, when I'm, what I'm about to say. Like, my heart is for mothers. So don't, don't, don't hear this as shame, condemnation, judgment. That is the furthest thing from my mind. And so, like, if you're a woman here, mother here, and you have had an abortion, man, 
we have grace and mercy and love and forgiveness for you. We don't think we're better than you. You are welcome here. We love you. We esteem you. We want to help you. Amen. Like all that. So don't, don't get that twisted. Don't get it twisted. But let, me, but let me walk through this because I think we have to learn how to fight. And if you're going to fight in a godly way, you have to know what is going on, okay? So I think that very few people understand the fundamental issue of abortion. Instead, I think, instead I think that abortion is buried, it's buried under a litany of other issues. It's like smoke screen, smoke screen, smoke screen. And everybody's like, what am I looking at? And that's how cold, I'm like, I'm mad about this. Well, are you even looking at the issue? So it's framed up as, sometimes it's framed up as healthcare. Um, and I thought, think of the twist and irony in that. Healthcare for who? And I'm all for healthcare for women. Let's just apply healthcare to everyone. Uh, number two, it's framed up as a woman's choice. So, so I've already heard like this week, no uterus, no opinion. Like if you're a guy, you can't talk about it. And I'm like, well, do you really want to apply that to every single issue in life? I'm not saying I'm, I could walk in your shoes, but I do know what the Bible says. And I do love women, love my wife, love my daughters, love my mother who passed away, right? All that. Um, and, I, and I think when you, when you come at this angle, and I want you young ones to really hear this. Because there are a lot of times I'm preaching, it's like preacher choir. A lot of you are like, I'm already there. But I think a lot of like younger ones, you're getting pulled and swayed by cultural arguments that are really flimsy. Uh, so when it comes to a woman's choice, here's what I would just say. It depends upon the nature of the choice. That's true for all of us, isn't it? So, so rather than going, I can just choose anything I want to choose. Well, none of us can do that. There are hundreds and hundreds of things that I can't choose legally, just speaking legally. And so there are restrictions on my right to choose because some things, right? I can't do it. I would break the law or they're unethical, etc. And so when you really boil that argument down, that framing of that argument down, a woman's choice, it's, it's choice in a really limited sense. And here's, here's the argument. It's choice in the sense that, uh, that the, to, to end the life of a, a child, to end the life of a child before the child emerges from the birth canal. That's the choice. So when you say it's, it's, it's a woman's choice, like you, you're, you're really not talking about choice at large. You're talking about the choice then to end that child's life before that child then emerges from the birth canal. And I think you have to really like think about that. Um, a third argument or the way it's framed up is that it's a part of my body, so hands off my body. Well, I would just say this, uh, the baby's not a part of your body. The baby's not like an arm or a leg or a bladder or a kidney. The baby is a body with its own unique structure in DNA inside of your body. Your housing for a brief season another human being in your, your body. And so it's, a baby's not a part of your body, it's, right? it's its own body living inside of you. So you can't think about like a child, like it's an arm or I get to do what I, I can do what I want to do with my arm or my leg or another body part. Um, it's also framed up as women's reproductive rights. And in our culture, like that's all we ever talk about. My right, my right, my right, my right, my right. Um, and I just think we have to really take a step back and think about other people's rights too. Um, and then, the, you know, the first article, and this is probably the saddest one of all, the first article that I read this week 
there was like an op-ed piece in like either like Slate or Politico where, where several women said, uh, and I don't think this is like the heart of women, this is just specific to this article, said basically, if, uh, if Roe v. Wade is, is overturned, uh, it is going to ruin the hookup culture. And I just thought like, wow, like that's actually an article. It's like you actually wrote that. Um, and so all kinds of like framing, the way people frame this. It's healthcare. It's a woman's, it's a woman's choice. It's, it's a part of my body, hands off my body. Uh, women's reproductive rights. Uh, it's the solution for a hookup culture. And I think here's what happens. I think people get all heated over boom, 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 boom. And then politicians are just stirring all those issues. Political groups stirring up all those issues. And it is just a, it's just a mess. It's like this. It's chaos. It's just a mess. When in reality, by definition, abortion is the, is the violent termination of a pregnancy. It, it, is, it is forcing the end of a tiny, fragile baby's life. That's what it is. But do you ever hear anybody talk about this? We don't go there. Because it's hard to look at. And so all I'm saying is this. Would you at least look at it in the eye? The issue. And if you've like, man, like I disagree with you, you could disagree with me. I'm just saying, would you just look at it in the eye? Don't let all the red herrings keep you from at least assessing what it actually is. Because culture is like slain, just like a myriad of other hot button issues into our faces, thereby diverting our attention from the actual issue. So, so my question is this, do the most vulnerable people in life have rights to? Does an infant in utero who can't speak up, protest, defend themselves, nor demand protections, policies, laws, and rights, does that infant deserve to have someone speak up on their behalf. I, I think that we've forgotten about that. Another flimsy cultural argument that is floating around in the Christian community, and it is a ridiculous one, is this, uh, and I hear lots of, lots of Christ followers use this. It's this, uh, the idea that pro-life people really don't care for, love, look after mothers who are pregnant and, and scared. Well, well, today, there are adoption agencies. So some of you know my story. I have never met my, my biological mother or father. But I thank God every single day that, like, they chose life. <laughs> Amen. Like, I thank God for, for that every single day. And so there are adoption agencies. There are 4,000 crisis pregnancy centers in the U.S., some large, some small. There are 90 crisis pregnancy centers in Minnesota. Just to, just to kind of compare it for you so you can kind of see, get the lay of the land here. So 4,000 crisis pregnancy centers all turned to pregnancy centers, 90 right in Minnesota. There are 600 Planned Parenthoods in the United States. So there, there's, there's, there is care out there. Uh, I would also say churches like, like Grace, like we want to come alongside Mothers with love and care and hope and mercy and grace and help and forgiveness. Like we have an entire ministry, an entire department here called One Less, led by Christine Erickson. That's like amazing. It's amazing. And the whole vision is like one less abortion, one less child and foster care. It's just one less, just one less, one like one at a time. And so, yeah, like, like we care and we want to help. And again, like there's no, there's no judgment here 
So we're not here to shame anyone. I'm not here to shame any woman who's had an abortion either. Like that's not our heart at all. So I would say this, like no, like no doubt, it's vital to love both mother and child. I, but I don't think it's an either or proposition. And I would say to those of you who use that argument, like, well, apply your same logic and rationale to the babies. Don't babies need care and love and help too? So abortion ultimately then, and like people aren't going to like this, but ultimately then is not about choice, not about rights, it's not about health care. It's actually about what happens to the baby in the act of abortion. And then, and then, and then what happens to the mother? Because we care about the mother too. So my point is just this. Why, why can't we care deeply about both the mother and the child? Why, why, why can't, we, why can't we, we do both? And so don't get distracted, especially you young ones. Don't get distracted by what culture is saying, by what your professors are espousing. Don't, don't get distracted by what culture is saying. Pay attention to what they're not saying. And so I would just say this, keep your eye on the ball. Don't let ah, 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 all that keep you from what is the issue we are trying to address from a biblical standpoint here. And so can I encourage you then, as we apply this, don't fight like the political left or the political right on this issue or any other issue. Don't take your cue from any politician, right? You go to war in Christ's strength, bringing his truth and his mercy and his love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness to the hurting and to the helpless and to the hopeless, right? Help, help create a culture of life, fight in a way that truly honors Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what it means. That's what Paul is talking about. You fight with weapons of righteousness in your right and left hand. So think before you speak. And if you have to post something, let me give you the, oh, please. If you have to, think. Don't just be emotional. Be thoughtful, reasonable, logical, respectful. Because you're not just trying to win an argument. You're trying to win a person over to the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So think, be mindful, right? Am I helping the cause? Am I hurting the cause? So, so Paul says we set roadblocks, obstacles in people's way when we don't handle trials well. And when we fight like everyone else in the world does. So let's be informed, let's be smart, let's be Bible students, and let's reflect the character and nature of Jesus in the way we communicate with people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Finally, Paul says we thrust obstacles in people's way and we don't manage well the extremes of life. So he says, listen, here's the question. Are you godly through, verse 8, look, are you godly through honor and dishonor? Or are you only godly when people honor you? Can you be godly when people dishonor you? Uh, through slander and praise? When you're treated like an imposter, yet you know who you are? As unknown, yet well-known, as dying, and behold... We live as punished yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making uh, many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Paul is essentially saying, listen, there's nothing more detrimental to the cause of Jesus Christ than inconsistent Christians. Like good days, we were good with Jesus and bad days, man, we do not represent him well. We have got to be consistent. We got to stay balanced when life is good and when life is hard. And I would say this, consistency and balance leads to maturity. And the world needs a few Christian adults in the room. How many of you are like, we need a few Christian adults out there, like helping, helping, amen? So let's not put any obstacles in anyone's way. Let's not hinder anyone from coming to Christ and growing in Christ's likeness. Let's be mindful that there are people who are watching how we live and how we handle trials how we fight and defend our positions 
and how we consistently follow Christ. So let's open the door wide for the gospel of Jesus Christ, both with what we believe and how we live. Amen? And so today, pray for help and strength. Some of you may be in like the trial of your life, facing troubles, right, tragedies, and you may need that strength. So ask God to give it to you right now to endure well for the gospel's sake. Uh, I want to encourage you to fight and fight back in ways that love people and honor Christ. And if you're here today, I, want, I don't want anyone to feel like left out in this. If you're here today and you're like, I am, I am struggling to hang on here. Like I've had an abortion or I'm considering that. Listen, we have, a, we have a one less ministry that we would love to meet with you, talk with you, encourage you, love you, not judge you, but embrace you and help you, okay? So at the end, man, if you need that, we have a prayer ministry. Folks will be in there to love you up and encourage you along the way. And then finally, I would say this, we all need to assess our consistency with Christ. When life is good, it's like, yo, I'm on, I'm on. Well, what about when life is hard? Are you on then too? Because we need like the balance in the Christian life. Not up, down, not juggle and hide, but consistently following the person of Jesus. Amen? God, thank you for your word. And I do pray today, Lord, that you would just do a work in our church. You do a work in our hearts. That you would encourage people, Lord, to live biblically, to think biblically, to react biblically, to respond graciously. Help us to be a witness to the world. Help us to fight and fight back with weapons of righteousness in our right and left hand. Help us to know the issues, to know what the word says, and help us as a church not to get played by culture, but to know the word, to be able to discern what is true and what is false. So would you help us to that end? I, I do pray today for, for women who have lost children, through miscarriage, through abortion, I pray for an extra measure of your grace and mercy and kindness, that you would overwhelm them even now in this moment with your love and mercy. Thank you for a chance today to, to study, a chance today to be challenged through your word and help us to live it out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we respond.
Father God, we praise you. We were dead in our sins. But you and your grace, through your son Jesus, raised us to life. We praise you for that, God. We thank you for your grace and your mercy to give us another day to change and become a little bit more like you. We bless you for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good to be together to be reminded of the grace of God, grace and mercy. Study his word together, sing together, fellowship together, celebrate mothers together. We're uh, really hoping you have a fantastic today with your family, fantastic day today with your family. If you've come today to Grace Church and as we continue in worship, you're prepared to give in worship. Um, You'll find giving stations at all the entrances and exits as you leave here today. If you're watching online, you can give at grace.church slash give. And you can also give in the Grace Church app, which so many do on a weekly basis. You know, your giving allows us to continue the, uh, the mission of Grace Church of making disciples of Jesus Christ across the street and around the world and, 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 and having ministries that, that minister right here in the body of Christ. And if you're here today and you're new to Grace or you've been here for a long time and you're like, I got to get in the game. I got to get into a ladies group. I got to get in that one less ministry. I got to get into a guys group or young adults or students or children's. I got to find a place to serve. Go to grace.church slash connect. And there's a place for you here at Grace Church, a place to belong, to feel like this is my, this is my church. Grace.church slash connect. Go out to one of our guest central locations there and some from our team will be able to meet you, greet you there and, uh, and just help you find your way around, around Grace Church. We're really glad that you're here. Let's stand together today. And once again, we really want to honor moms today. And so just as a little, little way of, of, of celebration, there's a photo booth out here, door four side. Go out there and get your picture taken with your family. And we want to express our gratitude for all moms and mother figures today and celebrate families here at Grace Church. All right, if you are in need of prayer, Pastor Troy gave a nice long list. A lot of people, including myself, we need prayer. We need the body of Christ to come along. If you've got some questions about your own spiritual journey and so forth, come on down to the front. Go to our prayer resource center right over to your left. If you're online, you can go to grace.church slash prayer, and we will pray for you. Pastor Troy is going to come up now and close us. Happy Mother's Day. Like know that, that we love you and know, know that I do. Uh, so as soon as I sat down over there, I felt like the Lord was saying, you forgot to say this. So I'm gonna say this. In all this, all this talk today about moms and all the topics and the issues, no one's laying the blame at the feet of women. Men have skin in this game too. So I don't want any woman here to leave today thinking, yeah, what, come back on Father's Day. <laughs> come back on Father's Day, all right? Come back on Father's Day. Because no one's blaming you, right? Like men need to be men too. In 1 Corinthians, Paul has this little phrase, act like men, like men. And, and I, I think things could really change in our culture if men acted like men. If men acted like men. So I don't want any, any woman here to leave today thinking all on me. I don't think it's all on you. And I think there's grace and mercy for all of us. Amen. And we all need it. And we all need it. But I hope you've been equipped and challenged. And I, and I just hope you'll think and you'll pray and you'll ask the Spirit of God to guide you and speak truth to you. Amen? So I pray the Lord will bless you and give you the best Mother's Day ever. In Jesus' name, amen.